It's Rusty Diamond, motherfucker. Yo, man. Boom, it's Rusty. What's up, everyone? Welcome to the podcast, the Public Access Podcast. Here on the Quantum Global Broadcasting Network, QGBN. Uh, I think I said I'm your host, Rusty Diamond. And you can check out other great shows on the network, such as When the Gloves Come Off, The Thinking Man's Pro Wrestling Podcast. This is it with Lizzie and Saved by the Ben. And the show is brought to you by Fred Ben Savage's Fuck, Stone Reef Productions, Hardcore Entertainment, Hypnosis is Great, and Sockemup.org. You guys. I guess just sock them up, but you can go to sockemup.org, check it out. Not yet because we have website stuff and we just switched the website over. So you can just search sock them up. Uh, you should be there. So, hey, you guys, it's Friday. I'm not at the water park today. We're going to the water park. I'm not under water park time constrictions, constrictions, restrictions. Constraints is what I was going for, but constrictions. I think that's gonna be a new word. So, thank you everyone for being here. And I'm gonna bring on a special guest right now. And right here, and right now, we have Lainey Liberty and a picture of a black lab. How are you doing? It's actually a black Mexican street dog. He's a rescue. So Whoa. He's, not- <laughs> he's not allowed. He's a street dog. Okay. Uh, how'd that come about? I was in Zihuatanejo and I was hosting a conference and across the way, there was an animal rescue and the conference was for families who travel world schoolers, which we might talk about. Maybe, maybe not. Um, but I've I've produced and hosted 10 conferences, so I've been really active. And in fact, I'm kind of known for starting this movement. But anyway, so I was trying to organize, um, you know, time for the families that are at the conference to come over and, and, you know, tour the rescue center. And they were doing really good work. They had about 38 or 40 dogs that were adult dogs or or not puppies anymore in one area. Then they had all the puppies and cats in another area. And I walked in there and I sat down and had this little skirt on. It was so, it was like over a hundred degrees and I had a bathing suit top and skirt. And I walk in and all these dogs are super excited and they're like sniffing my butt. And I'm, (laughs) you know, scooting back to the bench as close as I could. And I scoot down And this dog from across the field comes around and walks over to my side and puts his head in my lap and looks up at me with his big brown eyes. And all the volunteers there are going, what the hell? This is our most nervous dog. This is Carlos. And he's afraid of everybody. That's crazy. He really just likes you. And I was like, oh my God, that's so sweet. Oh, and I... Came back, produced conference. I saw him again and I was like, oh, this is the cutest little dog. And he's so warm to me. And I came back. I live in Mexico and I didn't have any animals at the time. And a month later, I messaged him and and I just kept thinking of Carlos, Carlos, Carlos. What a name for a dog. And I messaged them and I said, is he still available? And they're like, that one? Yeah, nobody wants him. And I do. (laughs) Perfect. Yeah. And so, so, yeah. He picked me. <laughs> he did. It sounds like it. Yeah. And you got a good Mexican street dog. Um, I actually have three me- of them. <laughs> three Mexican. Are they all Mexican street dogs? They're all Mex- well, I live in Mexico. So they're all, me- all Mexican rescues and they're all kind of mutts and they're all big dogs and they all get along great. And yeah, that's my pack. Yeah, that's a good deal right there. It's um, yeah. When you can get the few dogs and you're living a pretty good life and you know down in Mexico and so yeah. I guess I, I know you've answered this on a million other podcasts uh, <laughs> but why did you move to Mexico I, I I'm out of my curiosity what brought you down to Mexico 
Yeah, good question. So um, I'm just going to assume you don't know anything about me, and I'm just going to. I don't. Okay, I cool. don't. I don't. <laughs> I don't want to lie. But it, oh, this well, is like, cool. so it's like we're walking by on the street for the first time, and I say hello, and then this is where we are. And then here we are. <laughs> yeah, so. Okay, well, good. It just, it's like a fresh slate and it's clean and we can, we can go anywhere with this. So why did I move to right. Mexico? I didn't actually choose to move to Mexico um, in 2008. I'm from California. Where are you from? Housing bubble. Um, yeah. I'm Well, yeah, I lived... Uh, at that time, I was up in, I don't know, I'm basically from around Portland, Oregon. Okay, okay. I love Portland. Yeah, <laughs> it's, <scared. laughs> it's, yeah it's it's an interesting place. Uh, I live there, yeah, like over 30 years. So uh, I had my, I don't live there anymore, but. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, so you remember the, the economy crash in 2008. Right. It was a housing bubble, but it was also a lot of other things. And at the time, I was a business owner, and I owned branding a, a branding agency and we focused on serving green eco companies and nonprofits and you know I figured like I I had worked in advertising for almost 20 years and the last eight of those years was my agency and it was a small boutique agency that was really popular um we had you know million dollar of business every year which for a small agency was great yeah um, but by the end of the year, I knew I wasn't bringing my staff back because my clients were just going away left and right. And I was a single parent. I still am a single parent. Um, I, at the time, had a nine-year-old son. And he would always say to me, Mom, you're always working. You never spend any time with me. And I'm Aww. smiling now. But it was so true. It was, it, it, it was, it was the hard truth the reason why I'm smiling now is because that was the inspiration to, okay, I'm closing the business. Let's go travel for a year. We've got some money saved up. Um, I'm going to, we're just going to put all as much as we can in storage. We'll sell or give away everything else. And we took off in 2009 um, to travel for a year. We started in Mexico. Here we are. Um and we headed south. And the goal was to go from Mexico and end up at the tip of Ushuaia, which is Argentina. So we're just going to go down by bus and just let inspiration guide us. And it was going to be our adventure, our backpacking adventure. And um, yeah. So you said he was things. nine. I'm sorry. He, you yeah, said he was he, nine. He was nine. Wow. Two things. Yeah. We never made it to Ushuaia. And it's been, we, we're just starting on our 15th year and we never went back to the States <laughs> to live. So we've lived all over. We lived like three years in Peru. We lived in Ecuador. We lived in Guatemala for a year. We lived in Mexico in the beginning. Um, and then, you know, we started a company and did all this stuff. Um, but one of the things, and that led me to the conferences and all this stuff. So it was this whole movement. People started following us. Um, we were blogging. My son turned 10. And then we started podcasting. And Whoa. it just was, and this is, you know, 12, no, this was uh, 14 years ago. So you, you um, were in the early stages of podcasting. <laughs> early, early stages. So at the time, my son and I, we wrote, produced, edited, um, interviewed people. We did everything together. And this was like our travel wow. project. And it was so cool. And I love listening to his voice because, he, you know, a 10-year-old <laughs> is very different to the 24-year-old that he is now. Yeah, I bet. So <laughs> very, very different. But yeah, so we just happened to be in Mexico in, we arrived January, 2020, and we were hosting a conference in Playa del Carmen. And then my son and I, 10 years before, created a travel business where we take teens to different places in the world for these immersive learning experiences. And our clients are homeschoolers, unschoolers, those that don't go to school. And the premise was, let's go have this immersive learning experience and learn together. And it was great. And we still do those things where we still run our, our it's called Project World School. So our next trip is November 
where we've got a group of teens that we're taking to Thailand for a month. So yeah, that's that's kind of how I was here in Mexico. The world locked down and I just never left. <laughs> so here I am. <laughs> So then with these uh, teens you're bringing along, it's not the, the parents, it's just, it's just no. the kids. Yeah. <laughs> wow. And so how, what's kind of the way to, I mean, is it like an equivalent of being an exchange student? No. So like, I mean, so, I mean, what, how do you convince parents to, you know, take their kid away for, to say we're taking your kid away for to another country for X amount of time. Right. How do I convince them? Well, I don't have I mean, to convince yeah. them. Um, my <laughs> son and I have become quite well known in the homeschooling, unschooling, world schooling world. Okay. Um, I've written a book. I've built communities. I ran conferences. I have articles all over. We did a TEDx talk. People know who we are and they trust us. And they've watched my son. My son, by the way, his name is Miro. So if I mentioned Miro throughout the conversation, you know who I'm talking about. So they've okay. watched him grow up and the people trust me. And we've been doing it. Like I said, uh, we launched Project World School. 10 years ago, we've brought hundreds of teens to different places in the world. We've been to South Africa, um, Wales, Greece, Thailand, Japan, um, Mexico, Ecuador, Peru. Uh, I know there's places I'm forgetting. Vietnam, um, all over. So, so yeah, that was our life. We lived nomadically. For many, many years, there were some years we had bases in different countries. Like I said, Peru for three years, fell in love with Peru. We lived in Cusco, high in the Andes. Oh, um, how high is that? Oh, I could look it up real fast. I'm so uh, bad at retaining uh, numbers. Uh, yeah, that's okay. That's not it. Just curious. <laughs> But I live yeah. in a, a city now in Mexico that very much reminds me of Cusco. It's higher altitude and it's in the mountains. And being an L.A. girl, crazy enough, I discovered two things from traveling. Number one, fuck the beaches. I don't like them. <laughs> sorry. sorry. <laughs> yeah. You can you can say whatever on you. That's totally fine. You can say fuck the beaches. You can say fuck a lot of things. If you like, OK. So. <laughs> and. I mean, beaches are gorgeous. I just don't want to live at the beach. And then number two, being somebody who worked in Green Eco um, marketing and branding for many, many years, I was just like, you know, save the environment and all this stuff, like way before it was even popular. Yeah. Um, but I didn't have a true relationship to nature. And I actually fell in love with nature through our travels. And I remember that moment driving, we were on a bus and we were going from Cusco to Ollantaytambo, which is one of the, the cities in the Sacred Valley. And I just remember just sitting on the bus like this, looking out at the landscape, going, oh my God this is nature. This is incredible. So from there, I took up hiking and rock climbing and just nature walks, things that I never did when I lived in downtown LA. You know? <laughs> yeah. And right? the high desert uh, or whatever you would call it, uh, you know, mountain town or whatever. I mean, yeah, I'm, I'm a, I like that climate a lot. Um, <laughs> like, I don't know. Cause I, I'm back close to the coast um, living right now. I like it here, but I do. I wish there was some sort of high desert yeah. out here. Um, I mean, like everything health wise was I, I felt great up there. Um, yeah. And plus there are hot springs. Yeah, I, I'm a big hot springs fan. So that's yeah. a big help. I was living up in uh, Salt Lake City last um, but. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the beautiful place, beautiful place. Um, I mean, I get it. Look, there's nothing wrong with beaches. I just don't want to live there anymore. And I, when we left yeah. LA, um, you know, we lived in different beach towns across the coast and it was great. And then I just really discovered Beaches are great for visiting. I don't like the culture. I don't like living at the beach. And most of the places um, 
that we traveled to that were beach towns were really lacking or that we lived in at be, you know in beach towns they were lacking in cultural like museums and things like that and so like i really love art i love theater i love dance i love things like that that are really nurturing to my soul and there's only so many times you can just sit on the beach and stare at the water it's gorgeous right yeah yeah i, I get you yeah it you see that the, it doesn't do it much different it goes goes in and out yeah. in and out a little bit here and there and <laughs> it's the same same on every one uh some have more sand than others yeah that's, <laughs> that's about it um and so were you i mean have you had any um like with visas how how are visas are those difficult to work with um, being I nomadic? Mean, yes and no, some countries, yes, some countries, no. Um, being here in Mexico, I have a, uh, I'm a temporary resident. So that was a four year visa. That oh, I got. cool. Um, and then when the four years are up, which is next year for me, um, I could renew it to a permanent resident, which is great. Um, but this is the only time in our whole travels that I've actually settled somewhere and this feels like home. I've got dogs, like I said, <laughs> um, didn't have that while we were traveling and I'm such a dog person. Um, I've got a garden, I've got a boyfriend, you know, like, like things that yeah. I didn't have when I was traveling and it was just a trade-off. Um, but some of the countries that we lived in, in Peru, we know many people that live there now that you can't do this, but we used to do border runs and renew our visas. And then we just pay a fine if we went over and we knew what the, um, you know, the, what, where we could push, you know, things. Yeah. Also, you should probably know something about me. I, I am a mother, you know, and I'm very respectable. I, I wrote a book. I work with teens. I do all this stuff, but I'm also an anarchist. And so that means, and I've been an anarchist my whole life. It's also a fancy way of sort of prepackaging my ODD, which is oppositional defiance disorder, which I've had all my life too, which makes me a really good candidate to be. <laughs> I was a punk rocker and then, then a, you know, anarchist and I'm in my fifties. Yeah. So I've had many years oh, wow. of, okay. of, you know, like living as an, an anarchist. Yeah. And what that means to me is, you know, my rights and where yours begin. But if there are situations where there's no harm to anyone, I'm not going to follow the rules. So I'll find a way to make it work. And that's just part of who I am in terms of, you know, yeah. <laughs> my personality. My son, Miro, always says, Mom, you're just a contrarian. And I, you know, he has to reel me back sometimes. We've got this really amazing partnership um, yeah. in parenting and family and in business as well. And it's because we've got this deep connection and deep love for one another. Um, yeah. And and his childhood was based on partnership and in fact i wrote a book about partnership parenting so we could talk about that if you're interested <laughs> sure well, let's talk about that let's let's bring it up so it was that you wrote that book that was the the book you wrote or was there more is there multiple well there's one and i'm also working on another right now so i wrote okay. a book in 2021 <laughs> called Seen, Heard, and Understood, Parenting and Partnering with Teens for Greater Mental Health. So I know it's a mouthful, but... Right. Aren't they all? Are they all? I mean, you you got to have the, the subheader. You know? Right. Yeah. <laughs> Seen, Heard, and Understood. So that's really what the book is called. It's, I have a, I have two copies here if you want to see this is the anniversary edition that just came out Whoa. um it's my painting on the cover that's your paint cool painting. Uh, that's that's pretty awesome that's uh so is that your and then you this said is, you're into art uh, is that your preferred method of making art that uh painting yeah painting okay yeah yeah and so 
Okay, that makes sense then. And so then you got to you got to illustrate your your cover your book and as well as write it. And then so and when you're writing it, was it um, was it a linear process or did you have an outline fill in the blanks or? You're asking about the process of writing a book. Oh my God, it was terrifying. It took me a little over a year to write it. I worked with a writing coach. And because, oh boy, <laughs> so let me, can I kind of back up and give you a little bit sure. of context? Sure. Cool. cool. Yeah, that's, that's what, yeah. We, <laughs> we got context. Give me context. <laughs> All right. So when, when I was a child growing up, I grew up in a household that, that where I experienced a lot of trauma. Um, there was abuse. It, it wasn't physical abuse, but it was a lot of intellectual and emotional abuse. And part of my experience, um, you know, growing up, um, like I was raised with a lot of trauma. And I had spent a good part of my adolescence being a punk rocker, being <laughs> being a rebel and being all of these things. And mind you, I told you I was in my fifties. So it was the eighties and it was, it was the, the time where punk rock was just coming. Like I saw so many great yeah. bands. It was great. Um, but part of that, so yeah, I mean, it was part of a scene, but, but a good part of that was really one of my trauma responses was hyper independence. So I wanted nothing to do with my family and I'm going to do it my way and I'm not going to ask for help and all of this stuff. And that served me well throughout my adult life in many ways, but in many ways, it was something that I really needed to heal. Now, in the ways that it served me well, it really inspired me to be an autodidactic, so a self-directed learner. Um, I, I always felt like I could learn anything I wanted to learn, you know, screw schools, screw university. I, I've got a brain on the top of my shoulders in my head, and I'm carrying around this instrument, so I'm going to use it. And nobody could tell me I can't. Absolutely. And so, right? Yeah, and, I'm all for that. And so one of my, my passions was I'm going to heal these traumas. <laughs> I'm going to do it myself. I'll show you. <laughs> and I remember, I'll show you, always ran in my mind. And I did. I did so many deep dives into psychology, neurobiology, uh, uh, you know, all different kinds of modalities, healing modalities, sometimes some spiritual paths. And I did some psychedelics and I did like all sorts of things because my project was me. And I knew like I knew I was going to take my next breath. I always wanted to be a parent and I never wanted to parent the, in the manner in which I was parented. So for me, reading everything I could healing my, you know, attachment wounds and healing traumas and, and reprogramming my brain and doing all of these, these really radical things, which I thought um, became a big part of my path. And so I found that working with tools, like having a um, theoretical toolbox that when I got triggered, I knew I could do this and I could do self-reflection or self-inquiry this way and do this and really taking accountability and responsibility for self. And Just that punk rock. Yeah, right. <laughs> punk rock right there. And I mean, total, total. It, there's, yeah. And I, uh, I don't mean to interrupt you on no, that no, part, but ahead. that's something that's lacking very much now is the taking accountability as well as knowing to work, working through whatever has happened, because I talk about this on your kind of often and sorry for everyone that's listening about this, but so, I mean, so I thought that it, so when the traumas happen is stored in your RNA, and mm -hmm. I thought it was for, and it would affect two to three generations, mm -hmm. but it affects up to somewhere around 25 generations mm -hmm. down the line. And you can, if you work through it, then you're not, it's not going to be in your RNA anymore. And it's going to be something that your kids, their 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 kids aren't going to mm -hmm. experience. They're going to have to have that in them and not know why I feel this way what's going on why do why do i feel this way and it's just it's not there and so i mean 
you went through it. And plus another thing, uh, between punk rocks and hippies, uh, uh, hippies act nice, uh, but are dicks, and punk rocks <laughs> act like dicks, but are nice. And uh, that's something I, I learned along the way. But um, OK, so so side note, side note done there. So back to uh, actually, no, and it's not. OK, so the psychedelics. So was that Mexico? Uh, no, that was Peru. Or, so that that was in Peru. Was it was it the, the ayahuasca then or was yeah, that? Yeah, I, I did many, many ayahuasca um, uh, ceremonies. Healing, yeah. ceremonies, healings. And I also dabbled a little bit in Huachuma, which is also known as San Pedro. And for me, it just it was very heavy and very masculine um, in terms of the energy. It was really hard for me to to move through it. Um, but the ayahuasca, they call it the soul of the grandmother, the vine of the grandmother, the death, you know, grand, grand, grandma death or abuela. Um, and, yeah, go ahead. It's important. Oh, it's important too. Uh, and that was another thing. So one of my co-hosts, we were talking about this, about the, you know, I was saying I haven't really had a, we we're talking about like bad trips and I haven't really had a bad trip. Um, I've had some that got... Mm -hmm kind of borderline but he was saying that a bad trip is a good thing and um like you know with the ayahuasca like the the stuff that you need to work out is presenting itself in front of you and is putting you in the best possible mindset to be able to experience it and deal with it and so like a bad trip doesn't have to be a, a bad thing it just it's only a bad trip as long as i mean it will take and you can work through something in maybe 10 minutes and, you know, then you're, you're all good. And um, so, yeah, yeah, you've got healing and awareness. And I think you're tapping into something that is so common in the Western culture, which is we have such a difficult time being in discomfort and culturally we want to do nothing but mask it or he or not even heal it but mask it or numb it or whatever the thing is however people are dealing with it but they don't deal with it by sitting with the uncomfortable feelings and with all the background that I had in neurobiology and psychology and Jungian you know philosophy and things like that yeah it gave me the awareness that it was okay to face my demons to look at this stuff so yeah yeah it's yeah. you know it's it's life is about healing i think and and processing and moving and like you said i am really really tapped into wanting to heal generational wounds and not pass those things on it stops with me and it stopped with the way that i parented you know i didn't parent in an authoritarian paradigm i parented in partnership I, I parented and I still parent very authentically and very open and the, the sort of premise behind partnership parenting is connection over coercion and you'll find um, many people and maybe your audience that happen to be parents that have read books on say peaceful parenting or gentle parenting or conscious parenting all of those are great modalities but it stops a little bit short because it still tries to change the behavior of the child so that the in a peaceful way, in a gentle way, in a conscious way, so that the family gets along better, so that, that it's more convenient for the parent. And that's manipulation. That is that's a mask authoritarian um, paradigm, really, even though it just looks like sugar and spice. It's, it's, oh, sweetie, would you really like to brush your teeth? You know, that's a very peaceful, gentle way of, you know, or it's then the there's, yeah, it's it's the, it's the manipulation and it's parenting with an agenda, right? And so right. when you're in partnership, you'll say, I'm going to brush my teeth. Here's why I choose to brush my teeth. If you choose to brush your teeth, you know, this is your body. You have consent and autonomy. 
that we can stand side by side and brush together. But if you choose not to, you're not getting punished and I'm not going to coerce you. And the natural consequences of your choice, not mine, your choice is you may have pain, you know, if you get a cavity. So your body is your choice and that is partnership. There's no judgment. There's no agenda. There's no manipulation. And some people might be throwing up their hands going, yeah, my child will never brush his teeth then. But if you take this as an isolated one-time approach and the rest of your parenting is very authoritarian, hell yeah, they're not going to brush their teeth because they don't have the power to make choices in other ways in their life. And I'm right. saying, make this a broad, you know, keep, keep, keep the safe spaces Keep the communication open. Talk about per potential natural consequences, not to manipulate or, or instill fear, but to give them the awareness of what those natural consequences can be and let them know that you're standing side by side with them in whatever they choose to do. Because I'll tell you, I've gone to bed many times without brushing my teeth and nobody came down from the sky huh. and, you know, or a cop. Right. You know, you know, broke down my yeah. door. I bet every single person who's watching this has had uh, occasions where they went to bed without brushing their teeth. I don't do right. it often, but it yeah. happens. It happens sometimes. Yeah. And, you know, it's it's up to the person, whomever. And I mean, there's I've seen a lot of studies more recently with more of that kind of uh, relationship. And, you know, it's sure i think it was the the gimmick was that they could eat whatever they wanted for breakfast and so these kids were eating ice cream every day but then within i want to say it was like a week or two they realized i feel like shit i need to eat something good and then they did it on their own and yeah, yeah. they wore themselves out that's a difference between intrinsic motivation and extrinsic motivation. And that applies to learning as well. So I am a radical unschooling parent. Um, I am an autodidactic. I'm a life learner and I'm very, very educated. Although my education is not a result of my schooling. I'm pretty, you know, my schooling, I don't think gave me much of anything. And I no. even have a degree in art out of yeah. all things. But like yeah. I've, I have done these incredible deep dives into history and mythology and um, the psychology and all different areas that light me up because I have the, the accountability to, to educate self. That, it's me. It's me. If I want to learn it, I'm going to learn it. It's and there. It's there. And that's what I modeled to my son. And he is a fifth grade dropout. You know, we left the States. Yeah. So, um, but, I mean, everything, if you want to get, learn anything, you can go to school where I went to school after I spent a stupid amount of money yes. on college. Uh, you can go to YouTube university where you can learn just about anything you want. Um, if you want exactly. to learn courses that you learn in college, uh, MIT, Harvard, and Stanford all it have all their line. stuff online. All yeah. their all their books, all their lesson plans, all their um, you know study guides, exams. The only thing you don't get is a piece of paper and whatever. Okay. I mean, it's all about learning it anyway. Um, yeah, exactly. If you want to learn that way. And I mean, and there's, we have access to literally any book that hasn't been, you know, some you might have to go and get a, a physical copy of, but uh, for the most part, you can find any book or any sort of other, maybe research paper or, yeah. you know, go on Google, Google Scholar. Yeah, and you'll I find have. I have a lot of um, scholarly papers re referred to in these books. Why? Because they're accessible and I read them. <laughs> right. And anyone else can. Anybody else can. But yeah. I distill it in such a way where you don't have to, which is which is the good yeah. part about my, my book. But anyway. <laughs> right. And I mean, if they have every chance. They have every, everyone's got one of these things. And 
anything they want to know is right there. Anything like if you can't figure it out there, I don't know where where it is for 95, maybe 5% of the stuff you won't be able to find on this. But um, anything else is right here. It's just and anything you could ever fathom. Anything you want, you want to learn something, go learn it. School, exactly. fuck school, fuck school. Exactly. I, I wish, I wish, I wish I would have dropped out. I wish my parents didn't let me. If I would have, I would have got my GED before I started tenth grade. But my parents won't let me. And but I mean, I was already doing, you know, I was already working. I you know running my own stuff and like. Why was I going? And I did terrible in school. I did terrible in college. I did terrible high school, middle school, college. I still went and I hated every bit of it. Yeah. And, but I love learning. I exactly. just, I don't want to, I don't want to be at school. Like, no, no. Yeah. And that's what, one thing that school does really well is it teaches you not to have a love of learning. Right. So. And yeah, it takes 13 years or 12 years, I believe. I think, uh, who was it? It was Rockefeller or <laughs> somebody else. Someone, it if it wasn't Rockefeller, it was another one of those type of families um, that were the ones that invented the public school system oh. um, to yeah, be able to, and it takes, I think 12 or 13 years to fully indoctrinate uh, a mind, yes. eight, you know, with the eight hours a day and then being able to switch that right into the nine a to factory five system. Factory. Yeah. And that's, yeah, well, that's what's still going. The modern school system that we have today in the Western world is based on the Prussian system of indoctrination, education. Sorry, sorry. Wrong right. Word. Yeah, right. <laughs> and <laughs> exactly. it was actually and it was formed at the turn of the century, and it was designed to, um, uh, I don't want to say educate, but to condition workers for the factory. So that's why you've got 50-minute periods and a bell ringing. That's why you're not allowed to do deep dives in, in schools in, in the, within the Prussian system. It's short spans of periods you know of of focus um don't let your mind go too deep this is not about nurturing creativity or even problem solving this is really designed to indoctrinate and condition kids to take orders throw you on ritalin or whatever to adderall or something now and you, yeah. you start thinking too much and you know <laughs> it's it's really wild looking back on it um I know like I teachers were suggesting that luckily my parents didn't go along with that. Um, they, a lot of my teachers were saying you need to have have uh, me on, you know, Ritalin and all this every day. And I was like, no, nope, nope. And my parents were like, okay, sure, you're not you don't need it. And I mean, I, I don't know, I probably maybe would have been more in line, but more in line with something I didn't care about and despised. And if I would have stuck down that road, I would have done nothing that I would have enjoyed down the road when, you know, and, I don't know, yeah. And Rusty, you're important. Like you are important. Every single one of us is important. And for you to recognize that heading down a path that may not give you enjoyment or fulfillment, yet it's culturally acceptable to spend, you know, 40 years, 40 hours a week doing something you don't love or doesn't light you up because that's just how you have to live. Right. That is kind of a wasted life. And I'm glad that you recognized early on that you are important. You've got contributions and it comes from within. It's it's that that spark of passion that makes you you. Yeah. yeah. That's your thing. Yeah, it lasted till by my mid-20s. My mm -hmm. mid-20s, I was like, okay, well, yeah, this is. This yeah. is not for me. This is this is not my my life here. Um, yeah, I mean, I was 
I don't, yeah, done with done with school, and I dropped out of college, uh, like a four year university to at a government job for a while. Oh wow! And then, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I was like, well, yep. And then after that was when I started like really working kind of for myself yeah. and doing more of that. And, you know, I pick up side jobs here and there every once in a while, just to kind of make ends meet. And it's, yeah. Yeah. I mean, cause yeah, at like the school, the city I came from, it was expected. Everyone goes, goes to college, you know, yeah. then comes back, has, 2.4 kids the picket fence and uh you know Dies. works 40 hours yeah until <laughs> until you die and then you, you maybe you retire maybe get a few years um yeah. like yeah like uh like i my dad like he worked uh i think he was probably like a year away from retirement and died and uh how old was he 64 oh cool and so yeah, I mean, like, what what's the point of that then? Like, what is I, the- I'm 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 glad I didn't go going down that path and got to do something a little different. I've got to, yeah, travel and, and exactly traveling is important. Traveling is oh god, yes, <laughs> yeah, especially. Uh, so I mean, when you went to other places, like when you went to. You said you went to Japan. Did you go to Tokyo or something? Or okay. Yeah, we brought a group of teens. We did a couple of teen retreats there. Um, yeah, we've been been through Tokyo and Kyoto and Hiroshima and lots and lots of views of um, the surrounding areas. Yeah. So, what was it like for you over there as a, a blonde? Uh... <laughs> Um, yeah, I'm trying to think if I ever, I mean, just as a foreigner in general, um, you know, there's a, a lot of, of sort of, I don't want to say racism, but there's, there's a lot of cultural inclusion and it's a very closed culture and the history runs really really deep as somebody who you know uh came from china and created their own culture and they're an island and created their own um uh cultural practices and and history and traditions things like that which are based off of their parent cultures but what an interesting country and kind of a very very historically violent country and not very nice (laughs) like I learned more just by being there and having these really deep conversations and part of our trip we like so Japan is really interesting um they're not like the population is going down um people are not having babies because, you know, there's all these other ideas of things that they need to do. And when they do have babies, they're highly controlled and educated by the the age of three. They're introduced to at least five different languages, you know, in order to get into the best preschool. And it's very regimented and very controlled. So culturally, it's very, very rigid and very different to to my preference. You know, I'm kind of a free spirit. I don't know if you figure that out. (laughs) I feel much, you know, I, I feel a lot better in Latin America. But the interesting thing was um, we stayed not, we we went through some of the touristy areas like Tokyo and Kyoto, but we stayed in the suburbs in several communities where there were no young people anymore. For example, we were on an island. um, It was Hiroshima. I can't remember the name of the island, okay. but it's it's part of it, um, part of a chain of islands, and the island that we were on used to have a population of three or four thousand people, not very very big, but when we went there 
and our our um, partner arranged all these like really immersive experiences for us. So we stayed at the old high school that was built during the the seventies boom, where the government was putting so much money into restoration and and um, you know so it was this big fancy high school, big building on this island. There are only eight residents on the island and they're over 65 years old and having our group we had 15 teenagers plus our staff was four four adults and this is the most people they had had on the island in years 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 probably since the 70s and we did um we, we happened to be there during a Shinto um, festival where everybody would go around to these altars at different parts of the island. And whoever was um, the caretaker of this altar, they would give um, crackers or juice boxes or gifts to the visitors. And <laughs> they all heard that we, here we were doing this, right? We were on the island. They all heard that, you know, the eight residents that were there oh shit we have to go out and buy all this stuff because <laughs> here comes this big group yeah. of like 20 <laughs> people and we've never had that and they all thanked us and like I said they were all 65 or older they we kept we caught them in the fields um you know doing farming we caught them running the little tiendas or the little teeny little stores and eight people that live there that's just crazy this yeah. mass island and so learning the history of the island used to be a very prominent tobacco growing island the one that we were on um and all the young people left and there was just no work for that for young families or even people in their 30s or 40s and so people um either came back to retire or you know their family homes were there or they never left but the the elderly people that lived there were so gracious and they were so excited that this group of young foreigners <laughs> were there it was and they told stories and our our partner was uh japanese but lives in san francisco and she obviously interpreted everything for us and it just we learned we just sat in the fields and they told stories of you know the heydays and I am such a proponent of learning oral history through storytelling. I think it's one of the most powerful, um, you know, forms of history. And I think we as Western culture have forgotten how powerful storytelling is. Yeah, that's not um, written by uh, through the perspective <laughs> of a textbook company uh, based out of Texas. Yes. You're right. Uh, or has, Eurocentric. I mean, even anthropology and history has got a Eurocentric, uh, you know, um, uh, like angle to it. Right. And, and it, yeah, it's, uh, it keeps kind of, I don't know. Yeah. I mean, there's a reason. I mean, stories are passed down yeah. for a reason. And, you know, without a younger generation there, I mean, you guys get to be the ones who get to tell the stories of, of them since, or else, you know, maybe some other people who come onto the island sometime, but probably not too many of those, just like you were saying, that are not so many over there. But I will say, speaking about storytelling, because I love storytelling so much, every country we go to when we do teen retreats from Thailand, Japan, um, Wales, Peru, Mexico, we hire storytellers to tell us the myths. And with each myth, there's like this kernel of historic relevance that helps us understand how the culture formed in the belief system. And as we were talking about in the beginning, you're right, sometimes at least seven generations, sometimes up to 25, they carry the stories of, of traumas and, you know, like 
you know, the, the, the history of monsters or the history of cloud people or, you know, these kinds of belief systems right. form the collective consciousness of any community, any culture. And that really helps you to understand our worldview as it's very different than somebody else's, right? Right. Okay. And then, so let's say you're maybe uh, if you're in a town like like that you're plopped right in the middle of town but you're by yourself or maybe it's you and your son where's the first place you're going so as my son and i traveled alone um we just like where we went was based on inspiration and the locality of where we were. So where are we going to go next? Well, here's all the places. It'll take us 10 hours to get here, 30 hours to get there, four hours to get, where do we want to go? Let's check it out. When we get to a place, we don't know where we're going to stay or what we're going to do. So the best way to find a place is to talk to locals. And so the communication with locals became such an integrated part of our journey. And um, neither of us spoke Spanish when we first set out. And we both speak Spanish now. My son a lot better than me, of course, because he was so young and he learned it really, really quickly. Yeah. But speaking to locals is so like the habit of speaking to locals is such an integral part of like understanding a culture and we like to say that our travels took us deep versus wide you know over like 13 years of travel um right and we went to almost 40 between 40 and 50 countries and that's not that many i know people that have been to hundreds of countries yeah we haven't been to that many but we went deep we we immersed yourself in the cultures and so storytelling is um huge one of the things that i'm really fascinated with and i've seen several are um ufos and things like that like i love that and you have and cusco um peru is a hot spot for ufos or ovnis um and lots of crazy stuff like oh my god so we were what do you oh I'm sorry what do you see like are you seeing this in the, in the sky or are you yeah uh, sometimes, have you had any encounters no i i i don't not that i know of <laughs> not that i remember but they're always so fascinating to me and um we've seen four or five of them actually and we actually had one follow us on a bus when we were going over the top of a mountain high in the andes and then going down the other side down to the jungle the amazon jungle we had we had one just tailing our bus it was crazy i kept watching it then it went over a a hill i mean just clear as day I saw it but one of the things that we did um because you know nobody ever said I couldn't do it and I always just oh. do what I want to do I just right. ask um I there was a researcher who um has been on many ancient aliens uh programs and um you know lots of YouTube videos of of things he did work around the elongated skulls in Peru and the cranial deformation and the trepidation, which is the holes. And he did lots of research. He wrote a book. Um, and I, when we were in Peru, I was like, oh, this guy, Brian Forster, he's in Paracas. I'm going to send him a message because we're coming down there. I want to work with him. So I sent him a message and I was like, hi, my name is Lainey. My son is Miro. He's at the time, I think it was 11 um, or 10, who knows, 11, probably 11, 12 ish. And I was like, we want to assist you. Okay. So we're going to come down and do that. <laughs> and he's like, okay. <laughs> so we did, we came from Lima, we took a bus down and um, he's like, well, this is what I need right now. We are, I'm working, um, supporting uh, a maestra um, who found all these elongated skulls and I need somebody to come down and photograph them. Can you do that? Sure. 
So I went to like a hardware store and I built like a, um, a lazy Susan and made a little stand. And I brought my, my green travel towel, which I still have. And we set up this whole rig and I put my camera on a tripod, a nice 35 millimeter. And, and we put the skulls on them where we, you know, took photos of them 360. And we photographed, we had gloves on, we picked up these elongated skulls. Some of them were mummified. Some of them were, you could tell the cranial deformation, but I got to learn what to look for. What were the hybrids? What were those that were not of human descent? What were the human descent that were using the cranial deformation to emulate those that came before them? And I got to dig in deep to these, um, like, you know, this, this branch of study and the fact that I got to hold these skulls and we spent over a week photographing all of them every morning we'd come down to the um uh the uh museum a real small private museum and work with Brian Forster and and the senior who uh ran it and, and the archaeologist archaeologists who found all these skulls and the last day that we were there so I did we photographed 19 skulls and the last day that we were there brian said well come on i'm going to take you to this this um sort of graveyard thing it's big sandy plain um called chongos and we have to hop over a river and go under a fence because part of it we have to go through sneak through private property and we're going to see it and so um I have pictures too, if you want to see it. <laughs> sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so we did all that. And as the wind came, it blew up full skeletons. It was crazy, the stuff that we saw. And I got to learn the different um uh cultures. There was the Lima culture, there were the Incas. And then there were the pre-Incas and the pre-Incas are what some people call the Paracas culture or those that came from the stars. And those are the ones who are um, accredited with building or creating the Nazca lines. Paracas is really close to uh, Nazca. And so we did these wonderful explorations and then eventually Brian moved to Cusco and we met up with him there again. And so we helped him with like his measurements of this great uh, temple called Coricancha, which is sits in the center of Cusco. And there's all these things called ley lines, but, but they're not ley lines. We know them as ley lines, but they're they're called seques, actually. And they come to the center of um, Cusco in the center of of Cori Concha, this, this temple where a church was built on top of it. And then around the turn of the century, there was a big earthquake and, you know, they, you know, it was revealed that the Spanish built on top of this much more ancient culture and the lines, all the lines from the Sacred Valley and Cusco, there's there's these points called wakas, and they're either temples or energy points, and everything leads to Cori Concha into the center. And so we helped him with these, um, you know, doing measurements and recording. And here's my son. Now he's probably 15 at this point. And he's a seasoned, you know, um, archaeologist researcher at this point because we've been on all, all kinds of archaeological digs and just crazy experiences that are highly educational because nobody told me I couldn't do it. I just asked, can I come and right. be your assistant? And so that was his education. And the OVNIs are really a deep part, OVNI UFOs are a deep part of the cultural um, history in Peru. And that's part of the reason why we stayed so long. I was just so fascinated with everything. And I learned something that I created as a analogy for life. What I learned was... Machu Picchu, if you go to Machu Picchu, the guides, the official guides, and those are the only ones that are allowed to work, have to be licensed by the government, which is 
um, very, very controlled. And they tell the story that Machu Picchu was built by the Incas. And all the tourists that come are like, oh, I came to the land of Incas and look at this grand place. And wow, it's really crazy and really great. And let me wow. take a picture for my dating profile, please. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Put it on my Instagram. Yeah. <laughs> but what I discovered from the independent researchers is that Machu Picchu wasn't built by the Incas. The Incas were searching for the lost city when they came, and they were searching for the center, the navel of the world, the, the belly button of the world, which became Cusco. And they were looking for the cities around, which were mytho mythologically um, part of their culture. And they were looking for these lost cities, the, the you know, these per, perdita, you know, the lost cities. Yeah. And so imagine how different it would be from the tourist board and the marketing. Come to Peru, see Machu Picchu, the land, the site the Incas found and built upon, built on top of. Like that doesn't sound as good. And so understanding that there are different tellings of history and those that are about my age grew up with a different history taught in their, their schools to the history that's taught now about just say Machu Picchu. And so sitting down with elders and having conversations, the storytelling is such a rich part of getting down and learning what the traditions are of a particular country. And I said that um, this gave me an analogy for life that I live by now. It has, I don't, I don't claim to know the truth about anything. How could I? I'm just a single human being, right? But what I do know is I've got a body of information. These people believe this. Um, this group of people believes this. Here's the story told here. And here's the story told here. And now my understanding of this place or, or a situation or an event in history is really complex. And even though I don't know what is true, I've got a rich tapestry of understanding of possibilities. And that makes my world really, really rich too. And yeah, I mean, it's a <laughs> lot more than what you would learn from a teacher that read from an instruction manual yeah. and told you, and that's your truth forever. Yeah. Go out and experience it. And so if people are going to want to go out and experience anything of the sort like that, how would they find you, get a hold of you, and work with you? Oh, <laughs> well, I, I primarily work with teens. And so, like I said, we have Project World School, which brings teens to different places in the world. And I also do online uh, courses where I teach tools for greater mental health. And those are based on the tools and the research and the application um, that I've been using these tools, not only on myself, but in my family dynamic and with the teens that I worked with during Project World School, I now teach those tools uh, online and my company is called Transformative Mentoring for Teens.com. So you can find me at that site as well. And then you can pick up my book, which, you know, both, both copies is the same book, uh, different covers. This one has more tools. It's my anniversary edition. It has six added tools, and a little bit of just a little bit of editing. But this book is you can get this in paperback and in um, a digital copy. It's got a whole chapter of nothing but tools here to help you to understand your internal worlds as a parent. It also talks about partnership parenting. And I also share a lot of stories from my childhood in how I took the, that experience 
how it informed who I became and what the lessons were and so forth. And a lot of people really relate, especially people my, my age or around my age that were raised in a time where we didn't really talk about our emotions right. and the kind of abuse that I experienced was just common. That's just how everybody was raised. People were yelled at, people were punished. People were not seen or heard. Um, yep. Yep. Yeah. yeah, you, so yeah. Shut, I'm shut, the, shut the fuck up and go outside. Yeah. I don't want to hear yeah. about it. <laughs> exactly. Well, it's time yeah. to change and really break those generational wounds and, yep. and feel those things and raise a new generation that is that knows oneself that can use the the resources internal resources within oneself to find the answers versus looking for another mommy daddy government mm -hmm. you just see the lights flashing yep. yeah they're shutting us down. They, they don't. They don't <laughs> they're like, this they're anarchist this. is talking way too much. <laughs> <laughs> uh, hey, lady, I, I'm happy we got to talk and um, I had a good fun. time. Yeah, getting to to meet you and yeah, not knowing where we're gonna go when we get to here. So I'm happy we got to do that. And uh, yeah, thank you. And I hope you have a great great rest of your day here. And yeah, keep in touch. Okay. Take care. Thank you. Yeah, you too. All right, that's Laney Liberty. So yeah, check her out, check out her book and fucking drop out of school. <laughs> if you're in school, drop the fuck out of school. Go learn. And check out other shows on this network on the QGBN, such as When the Gloves Come Off, the Thinking Man's Pro Wrestling Podcast, This Is It With Lizzie and Say By The Ben. The show is brought to you by Stoner East Productions, Fred Ben Savage's Fuck, Hardcore Entertainment, Hypnosis Is Great, and Sockemup.org. And you guys, if you want to, you can uh, call and leave a message. If you don't want to leave a message. Messages? Messages? We don't leave no stinking messages. You know, I, maybe you guys just don't ever do it because I like playing that clip. So shout out there to returning guest. So you guys, thank you. Like, share, subscribe. Check it out on YouTube or Rumble if you want to watch it. If you're already doing that, listen wherever you're getting podcasts. And that is the show, man. Boom. It's Rusty Diamond, motherfucker. It's Rusty Diamond, motherfucker. Ernest! 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 <coughs> yes, Pee-wee. You brought the snacks, right?